In this week's news, we're discussing Microsoft's October event, including the Surface Book, Surface Pro 4, Lumia 950 and 950 XL, and the Microsoft Band 2. All this and more on this week's episode of Bandwidth Blog on Air. Welcome to lucky number 13. Welcome to Bandwidth Blog on Air, the weekly podcast of Bandwidth Blog. Let's begin at the end of the event where Microsoft unveiled their new Surface Pro 4 and what they called the Surface Book. Now, the Surface Book is actually very interesting, but it's not a notebook um, as, we, as we're used to it. Uh, Brian, what can you tell us about the Surface Pro 4 and the accessories that come with it? Uh, well, Microsoft certainly had a great day in the news uh, yesterday. The Surface Pro 4 is bringing more internal improvements to the Surface Pro line than external ones. Um, internally, we're going to be able to now buy a Surface Pro 4 with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a monster one terabyte of solid state storage. And on other fronts, um, there are subtle improvements which come with the addition now of Windows 10. So we're going to be able to access Cortana through uh, holding down the Surface Pen button, uh, and that'll become up on the desktop automatically, much like how now pressing it once opens OneNote. Uh, and additionally, um, Microsoft has gone back to the drawing board with the Surface Pen, and they've integrated new technology that brings 1,024 points of pressure. So that brings the the, um, now what's called the Microsoft Pen further into line with Apple's Pencil. I think we're going to see the stylus wars to come, which will be an interesting take on Apple versus Microsoft. Just before we go into some more hardware specs, um, quickly talk about the, the Surface Pen, or what is now called the Microsoft Pen. As you are a Surface Pro 3 owner, what do you think the big differences will be there? Well, I've always felt that the Surface Pen has been the most exciting element of the Surface lineup, because using it myself in my day-to-day, -day, it's probably my go-to stylus. I wouldn't want to use anything else. And like we've just said, uh, Microsoft have now almost quadrupled those points of pressure from 256, which was on the Surface Pro 3, to now 1024, which is on the Surface Pro 4. And I think that's going to entice a lot of graphic designers. It's going to bring over uh, a lot of probably Wacom users who use graphics tablets for their work over to um, Surface Pro 4, which I think is a great move for Microsoft because it's almost moving the Surface Pro line in the direction of uh, Apple's MacBooks. Uh, um, and I think we'll see a lot more um, interest from creatives, especially in the Surface Pro line going forward. Um, I particularly would really like to try it out with Microsoft's Fresh Paint app. I've always thought that that's a really nice, simple, effective app to get people interested on drawing on tablets and using the, the Surface Pen. And I think going forward, that's going to probably be an incredible experience to use now with the new Microsoft Pen. Moving on to the Surface Book, I was actually very excited when I saw Microsoft announce this. Uh, because mostly because of the name, um, having a Surface Notebook so sounds like such a great idea, but that's not really what it is, is it? Well, yes and no. Uh, the Surface Book is probably the closest thing to a, an ultra portable netbook that Microsoft have ever come out with, but in principle, it's largely the same idea as uh, a Surface Pro 3 or 4, in that it is a tablet that comes with a detachable keyboard, uh, being that you can detach the central unit of the Surface Book uh, and to act as a tablet, or you can attach it to the hard keyboard um, to act as a full-blown notebook. And I think that's, that's uh, interesting because as a Surface Pro 3 user, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the attached uh, keyboard cover. I've always found it a, a little bit flimsy. And basically, in order to use it properly, you have to really lie it flat or make sure that it's working on an even surface, which I've always found a bit irritating because it's not something you can rest in your lap and use as a laptop easily. Um, that being said, Microsoft's hardcover keyboard that comes with the Surface Book brings with it some interesting things in that it's fully backlit and also it comes with a fingerprint sensor, which all Surface models up until now have lacked. Um, so I think it's interesting. It's a nice play on Windows Hello as well. So it'll be eligible to be able to use that fingerprint sensor and the web camera to log in, which I think is, is a good boon for Microsoft. It retails at about $1,500. Um, so I think it's, it's fairly on the pricey side, but in all honesty, I could see myself actually buying that over Apple's recently introduced MacBook line. So as we said at the beginning, most of the changes in the Surface Pro 4 are internal. Um, in terms of design, uh, it's almost identical to that of the Surface Pro 3. The screen size has been slightly bumped up, uh, but the tablet itself is still the same size, so that's great. Um, other than that, the only real change is the fact that the Microsoft Pen now doesn't slot into a little loop um, on the cover that goes onto the Surface Pro. It has a magnetic mechanism that actually uh, attaches it to the side of the tablet this time around, and it also makes carrying around the entire tablet without the cover much easier. Well, 
unfortunately, yesterday we didn't see a Surface phone as many of us were sort of hoping for from Microsoft's event. But what Microsoft did unveil were two new Windows 10 flagship devices in the form of the Lumia 950 and 950 XL. Now, uh, if you've been following us on Bandwidth Blog, we did know about that actually a few weeks ago when um, leakers across the internet revealed Microsoft's plans for both devices. And what was revealed yesterday largely follows that on par. Um, both of them will be um, fully fledged Windows flagships and will be carrying a um, 20 megapixel primary uh, shooter. So that should deliver some great snaps as I've experienced from other Microsoft um, mobile devices. Additionally, what is going to come with that is a display dock. So Microsoft's um, Lumia display dock will come with an HDMI out, uh, a display board out, as well as three uh, USB ports for removable devices. And using that is going to capitalize on the new feature within Windows 10 mobile, which is continuum. Like on Windows laptops and desktops at present, you're going to be able to transform your Lumia phone into a fully fledged Windows desktop computer, which I think is a great move considering how uh, manufacturers like Apple and Android have sort of waffled their way around establishing roles for each of their devices. Apple generally has quite confined roles for the iPad, iPhone, and uh, MacBook Mac line, while Google with Android at least try to generally stick Android on everything so you'll get a mixture of Android tablets, even desktop computers, or uh, smartphones. So I think that's going to be a really interesting feature to try out. What are your thoughts, Tennis, on the latest Lumia devices? Do they live up to all of our expectations? In terms of design, I think it, it has. I don't think we were expecting anything very different from what we had previously in the Lumia line. Now, with the 950, it's, it's actually crazy to think that it's been a full 18 months since we've seen a flagship Windows phone device. Uh, and in terms of the 950 XL, it's been 24 months since the the, since the uh, Lumia 1520, which was the last big fabric they released. So I think it's been a long time coming and people have been wanting Microsoft to, you know, push the envelope a little bit. They probably didn't do it in design. I don't think they need to. Uh, the Lumia devices have always been very well built, um, like Nokia's of old. And in terms of design, I think most people will be relatively happy, especially people that really want to take great photos, which those Carl Zeiss lenses has always been been famous for. I think everything will hinge on the experience of Windows 10 Mobile. Until we get to try out these new devices running the latest operating system, we can't really say much in terms of user experience, but we do think with features like Continuum um, and enhancements with Cortana, there really is a lot of things to be excited about here. Something which really thrilled me yesterday was actually the fact that Microsoft are finally looking at their app problem. Because I think the biggest challenge that Windows 10 generally as an operating system between desktop laptops and mobile devices has faced is that the store really lacks quality grade apps that people want to use. And something I'm really thrilled about is that Microsoft came out on stage and looked at a whole bunch of developers, huge developers such as Facebook, Uber, etc., that will now bring Windows 10 apps to the ecosystem. System. And I think finally that might resuscitate some interest in Windows 10 Mobile at least because, I mean, at least in South Africa, I always see people as generally quite interested in Windows phones. And they've what they've done well, at least in the South African market space, is that they've seeded the lower end of the market with really great usable phones. And I think as soon as we start to get worthwhile apps, I think there might be quite a big shift in terms of user interest away from the likes of Android and iOS. Uh, so with luck, I think with all those elements, the the uh, Lumia 950 and 950 XL could be quite a success if Microsoft play their cards right and continue that gravy train rolling. I actually agree with you, and I, and I really do wonder how much interest Microsoft can garner for these new devices and for Windows 10 Mobile, seeing that Windows 10 on the desktop has received mostly very, very positive reviews, and having used it for um, a couple of months, I must say I really enjoy using it. So if the same experience flows over to the, the smartphones, I really can't see any problem um, for anybody that wants to adopt something other than you know the Android or iOS. I think previously there wasn't much other choice, uh, and now there definitely is. Uh, let's just round off uh, the technical specs here. So the Lumia 950 will have a 5.2 inch 1440 by 2560 uh, display. It'll also have three gigabytes of RAM and a Snapdragon 808 processor. Now this is very much in line with what we've seen from other manufacturers in terms of internal specs. It would be interesting to know why they didn't go for that uh, Snapdragon 810 if they perhaps had the same uh, overheating issues that some other people had. But nonetheless, um, it, you know these are top-notch specs and with Windows Phone or Windows 10 Mobile, it's always been 
much uh, more forgiving on hardware than something like Android has. So I do think the experience will be very, very fluid um, and, and people won't have any any trouble there. And then for the Lumia 950 XL, the internals are basically exactly the same, but you do get a 5.7 inch display instead of the 5.2 inch one. On the wearable front, Microsoft also had something new for us in the Band 2, which obviously is the successor to the Band that came a while ago. Now, that device was much maligned and people were very fond of it do you think they can change the experience this time around i really hope they do because i think um what we really need is a well-made wearable that has a great amount of brand resonance um and especially in south africa i think people are generally really interested in wearables but they're always a bit confused about where to turn um you know some people want to look at, at a pebble smartwatch while others think i'll go for the brand experience of an apple watch or really try out android wear if you can find something applicable um so i think microsoft does have a lot of potential to play with here uh what i do like about the new band 2 is that it'll work with android and ios which i think is a great thing and it'll expand microsoft's ecosystem to those platforms which they've already been doing with uh, Microsoft Office uh, as well as Outlook and, and assorted programs that we've seen ported now to iOS and Android. So I think that's got a good thing going for it. It additionally has 11 new sensors in it. I think it's going to be a lot more accurate and hopefully usable for a great deal of um, for a great deal of tasks. And lastly, I think what the best improvement on it is actually is now how it looks, the external features of the product. Because I think that what really sort of fizzled with the um, original band was that it was really an austere, simple product that didn't really capitalize on being a flashy, exciting, wrist-worn product. And I think um, the new appearance of the band lends itself to that far more greatly. The band 2 also has Cortana integration, which I think is great um, and something that's that's missing from most wearables, that kind of voice recognition capabilities. And other than that, the band will also have have a barometer so it'll measure elevation for hiking and stair climbing now i'm not quite sure how that'll be implemented in the fitness tracking but that is quite an interesting innovation because we haven't really seen that in many other uh, other wearables other than say um, some from tom tom and, and garmin which, which is very very specialized for serious athletes now do you think this wearable is aimed only at those serious athletes or do you think us normal people that just like to go for a jog can also use it and enjoy it um, especially seeing that it's uh, $249 the price may be a bit on the premium side especially bringing it bringing it as a product into South Africa but I think this is aimed almost as generally as general gets uh, and I think it'll be something that should interest a multitude of consumers who aren't really necessarily serious athletes um, as, as looking at it as a consumer myself I could see myself buying one simply for the fact that even although i have an android phone i'll still be able to use cortana with it um, through cortana integration with the band too so i think that's a big plus for a lot of people um, and i think what microsoft have tried to do is cover as many bases as possible um, because if you're looking at something like the apple watch arguably it is a very specialized product more for communication really than sports tracking and i think what this is trying to do is it's cover as many uh, stepping stones as it can to be that all desirable wearable we've kind of been looking for whether it will become that i don't know i think we're gonna to have to wait and see sort of what consumer uptake is like and what the brand resonance is like um but i think microsoft have done a, a pretty good job overall of making it appealing to as many people as possible i think we're just gonna to have to watch how that price plays out because at 250 dollars it is edging slightly a, a bit on the unaffordable side for for most people i imagine who have some money and they want to spend that on a wearable Review Spotlight, where we discuss our thoughts on the latest review devices to reach our hands. In this week's Review Spotlight, we've got something very interesting. It's actually the first Firefox OS phone being launched in South Africa and is brought to us by Alcatel. Now, the Fire E... Brian, you've had it for a day or two. What are your first impressions? All right. Well, it's actually been a really mixed bag because it, taking it out of the box, it's something I want to love. It's something I want to like, but there's always the spanner in the works at some point that is changing my perceptions. So taking it out of the box, it, it you would be fooled for thinking it was your normal sort of low to mid range Android phone. It, it looks almost exactly like that. And it's what we've come to expect from Alcatel and that it's got a really nice, simple build it's attractive um, quite unisex I mean I think I could use it as happily as any of my female friends could um, so I think it's it's nicely marketed in that position now what strikes me as odd about this whole thing is that it's a decent smartphone but it's almost in a sense wasted I think 
and this is again is off only after a day or two of having used it, it's almost wasted as as a Firefox experiment. Um, I find Firefox OS, and now this admittedly is my first time using the OS, as I imagine it would be the majority of South Africans who would look at purchasing this phone. Um, having used it, I actually find it it's it's not really ready for um, general uh, consumption and use. I mean, it doesn't bring anything that we don't have on Android. Um, or iOS, and in essence, having used it, I actually feel it's it's a bit like stepping back two or three, even maybe four years, and using Android then when it was still uh, even gingerbread. Uh, and it, that's the general feeling that comes across. Um, that being said, it is well supported with apps. You'll get your Facebook, Twitter, uh, Line even, but unfortunately no WhatsApp. So it's it's growing in the right direction at least for a new-ish OS. It's got the, that good ecosystem going for it. Um, it's a little bit sluggish to use, and one of the things that, that really irritates me is it is really a sort of a web-based OS. So one of the things my bug bears with it so far is that uh, once I've, if I disconnect completely from the internet, I lose some of the icons for my apps that displays on the home screen. And now, this Firefox OS works similarly to iOS so that you can't get rid of the apps you have on your screen. Once you've downloaded something, it's there. So it's a bit of a pain to scroll through and just see blank app icons that just aren't displaying there. And I have to reconnect to the internet to download them again, which I find is is, is not worth it. And it's, it's irritating, especially as a South African consumer where my bandwidth is limited. I need to be economical with it. Um, overall, though, it's, it's a decent phone and I'm looking forward to getting more in-depth with it. Um, I'm eager to see whether Firefox OS actually grows on me or not. That was always going to be uh, the issue for any new OS that's coming to market. I mean, I think about Ubuntu OS, which a lot of people have been shouting for for years and years, and it finally came in a kind of a mid-tier, actually low-tier device, and people were left disappointed. I mean, the biggest reason why there isn't that much space for new operating systems is because the smartphone world is already pretty saturated, and other than that, it's very, very saturated with something like Android, which I think most of these other OSs are trying to emulate in being completely open, having people, you know, fiddling with it and, 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 and changing it as much as they want. Whether anybody else will be able to do that, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm also thinking of Swordfish OS, for example, which was a crowdfunded one, which... I mean, they delivered a phone. I don't think it made a big splash. So the question is, can something like Firefox OS actually make it in the real world? Firefox, of course, is a very famous like brand name. Um, I, I think most people have um, at least one instance of, uh, of the browser on, on a device. But can they actually translate that into smartphone sales, whether it be at the bottom of the range or perhaps sometime in the future a top-end device? I think the biggest problem facing Firefox OS, which is actually what you've just said, is, is saturation. Because at the, at the price point we're dealing with um, with the Fire E, there are plenty of Android smartphones that arguably so far do a much better job. Um, and it, if you bought this phone, I'm sure it would be for the novelty of having Firefox OS and saying, look at me, I'm different. Uh, and unfortunately, I, you know, I can't really justify saying that it's it's a good investment at the moment because it feels like it's it's really half finished so far. I think for Firefox to go somewhere really interesting with this, it'll have to be really polar. So they'll either have to economize and make this a really, really great marketable app for low-end um, smartphones, which I think would be a good approach. Um, especially if they were able to capitalize on um, how networks function in, in regions like in Africa or South Africa, as we are in. Uh, I think that would be a good decision. Or they go to the completely opposite end of the spectrum and make a really sophisticated, high-end um, operating system for premium smartphones. And that would be the greater challenge because at the moment Firefox OS is nowhere near that, um, which is a great shame because it actually has some potential. It's a decent-looking OS. It runs fairly smoothly, but it just it needs to diversify it's my finding after one or two days with it my perspective on it might change after i've had it for a week and used it religiously um but i think it needs to be so radically different that it becomes exciting that's all for this episode of bandwidth blog on air that was lucky number 13 thank you very much for joining us please join us next week for episode 14 of bandwidth blog on air you've been listening to bandwidth blog on air the weekly podcast of bandwidthblog.com